All right. So I'm not necessarily going to say an evening, an opening prayer because we just finished liturgy. And I can't, I can't add to that. Um, so the plan was for our liturgy study to finish vespers and then start talking about the liturgy the pre sanctified gifts. The problem is, I had one week where I was coming back late because of pre sanct because of um, clergy lady, and so I wasn't prepared. Then His Eminence grabbed me for the first week of Lent in order to go and serve with him in San Francisco. And so we missed that meeting. And so the long story short is we didn't get very far in Vespers. But it would be really weird for us to be talking about the pre-sanctified liturgy in the middle of Pascal, the Paschal season. So here, let's talk about it now. And then we can go back and pick up some other things from Vespers later. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the Divine Liturgy, the pre-sanctified gifts. I forgot to bring a booklet with me from tonight, but I want to point a couple of things out when we get there about what I'm talking about, but you may recall. Um, why do we have the pre-sanctified liturgy? Right? Because according to the canons of the church, so this, for example, in the 7th century, the, it's called the Quinisex or Pendec, the uh, Council of Trullo, um, in 692, Canon 52, on all days of the holy fast of Lent, except on the Sabbath, the Lord's Day, and the holy day of Annunciation, the liturgy of the pre-sanctified is to be served. Okay. Similarly, the Canon of Laodicea, the, the Canons of the Church uh, Council of Laodicea say, uh, no bread is to be lifted up and offered during the weekdays of Holy Lent. Right. So, in other words. We don't celebrate the Divine Liturgy during weekdays of the fast of Great Lent. Why? Because it's celebratory, it's resurrectional, it's joyful, it's a festival. Every Divine Liturgy is Pascha. Every Divine Liturgy is a celebration, a participation in Heaven. If Lent is an experience of our exile from Paradise, of how far we are from paradise. The Divine Liturgy is the experience of paradise, right? And so there is this sense that fasting is not consistent with the feasting and celebration that is the Divine Liturgy. Okay? Does that make some sense? The problem is, as we're praying more, and as we're fasting more, and as we're attending church more, the fathers of the church recognized, the saints recognized, we need strength. We need spiritual strength. And what is the source of our strength? It's Christ. And how do we experience that strength most from him? It's in the Eucharist. And so, very quickly, this liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, in other words, pre-consecrated gifts, came into being. Okay, and We'll talk a little bit more about how that happened. So, um, there's a, a pretty early on practice of people, even lay people, communing throughout the week. St. Basil and um, St. Macrina, his sister, they talk about this. We see this in, in a variety of other saints. But there was a practice first and foremost in the time of persecution, so Tertullian, in the third century talks about this. When Christianity was outlawed, what would happen is that the faithful would be given a piece of the Eucharist to take home with them on Sunday. And during the week they would receive, because there was no guarantee they'd be able to attend liturgy the next Sunday. There was no guarantee in the time of persecution when you might be able to go to liturgy next because it was illegal. And so the faithful would take Holy Communion home with them. And um, several times a week, in the case of St. Basil, he recommends four times minimum a week. In the case of Tertullian, in a letter to his wife, they, he talks about the fact that they were communing every day. Right? And they would keep this in a special place in their home, in a special little artiforion, basically a bread carrier, right? Bread box is what that means, basically. Um, but they had a special little container that they would keep the Eucharist in and commune from periodically. 
Okay. Um, this also became a practice for monastics who were out in the desert and didn't necessarily have access to a priest or a church regularly. Okay. So this carries over in monasticism. And frankly, it still exists to some extent even today with some hermits and some faraway monastic cells that don't have a priest there. Um, so, how did they do this? Well, we get a glimpse into this in the life of St. Mary of Egypt, who we're going to read about in just a couple of weeks, okay? The fifth Thursday of Lent. Please read the life of St. Mary of Egypt. If the short form, form is all you can do, fine. If you need the long form and can't find it, tell me, and I will email it to you. It is an incredible story that the Church appoints for us to read every Lent, right? What happens, she's been in the desert for many, 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 many years. And she encounters St. Zosimus and says, I need communion, right? I want to receive the gifts again. Um, I'm, I'm abbreviating and leaving out everything, right? It's an incredible, I still think it is one of the greatest um, honors that I was ordained on the Sunday of St. Mary of Egypt. Um, probably an insight into the repentance that I need. Um, but what, is she, what does it say? This is quoted from the life. Here the woman asked him to say the creed and our father. He began and she finished the prayer and according to the custom of that time gave him the kiss of peace on the lips. Having partaken of the holy mystery, she raised her hands to heaven and sighed with tears in her eyes, exclaiming, Lord, now let us have thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Right? Um, which we still say is part of our thanksgiving prayers after every communion. Um, but what were the two main things, the two main prayers, the Our Father and the Creed? Right? Um, and this is an insight into what they were probably praying, minimum, minimum, before they would receive at home. Okay? And where we see this actually is by the time we get to St. Sabas the Sanctified in Palestine in the 5th century, um, their lay people aren't so often receiving at home anymore, although there is still some experience of this. But in monasteries, there were still many times that there were monasteries without priests. I know that's unthinkable to us today, but in the early church, it was actually thought that monasticism and, cler and being clergy were not consistent with each other. Because to be a clergyman means to be a public person. It means that you have to serve the people. To be a monk means to withdraw from everyone, right? So there was a sense that most monks would try to avoid ordination. Okay. Um, nevertheless, there was still some, it still happened sometimes. Anyway, in the monastic life, what they would do is they wouldn't eat until after 3 p.m. Okay. Each day they would not eat until after 3 p.m. That's the ninth hour according to Roman time, right? Um, after the ninth hour service, who can remember, what did we pray tonight before the pre-sanctified liturgy began? There was another service that we did. Hmm? Which hour? Huh? Hours. Which hour? The ninth. The ninth hour. We celebrated the ninth hour tonight before, before the pre-sanctified liturgy. Look at what the monks did. After the ninth hour service, they would have the Beatitudes, who can remember, when was the first time that you saw me participate in the service tonight? I came out and started sensing the church at a particular point. Do you remember what they were chanting at that time? It's the Beatitudes. Then, guess why? Because they just finished the ninth hour. And then we started with the Beatitudes. Then, as soon as the Beatitudes ended, we heard Carlene read, The heavenly choir extols you and says, Holy, 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 Lord, Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Come to him and be enlightened, and your face shall never be ashamed. The heavenly choir extols you and says, Holy, 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 Lord, Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And then guess what we said? The creed. And then we said a short prayer of forgiveness, and then we said the Our Father. Right? Um... And then we stopped at that point. So the prayer of St. Ephraim did the dismissal and went into the pre-sanctified liturgy. 
It's called the Tipica service, and it is quite literally the service the monks would do in the Palestinian desert when there wasn't liturgy that day as preparation for the communion that they would then receive. And after the Our Father, they'd receive communion and then go into uh, excerpts from Psalm 33, including Taste and see that the Lord is good, alleluia. Who remembers what tonight's communion hymn was that they were singing while Father and I were preparing the chalice? Yes, us, the taste and see that the Lord is good, alleluia. And then what did we sing right after communion when Father says, Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance, and he puts the chalice on the altar and he begins to sense it. What did we sing? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Taste the bread, heavenly bread and the cup of life and see that the Lord is good. And then, after a short <clears throat> prayer of thanksgiving, the priest says, and the prayer of the anvil, we recited the rest of Psalm 33. Right? We are quite literally following the blueprint that they followed back in the Palestinian monasteries in the fifth century. We've copied it exactly tonight. Okay? In the preparatory part of the Divine Liturgy, before the Divine Liturgy began, and then at the very end of the, divine, at the, the, end of the Liturgy, pre-sanctified Liturgy. Sorry, that blew my mind as I was really kind of looking at this. I haven't really looked very carefully at the pre-sanctified Liturgy before. And it was so cool to see that we were quite literally following the blueprint laid out by St. Savas in the 5th and 6th centuries. Okay? Um, so next week when you come to pre-sanctified liturgy, watch this. Watch for this. And know this is straight from the deserts of Palestine from the 5th century. Probably a little bit earlier, St. Sava is, is the one writing it down, right, what he's seeing. He's not coming up with it for the first time. He's just writing down what they do, right? Um, all right. Now, the service of the pre-sanctified liturgy itself, the <coughs> earliest copies that we have of it come from the Codex Barberina, Barberini from the end of the 8th century, Okay. We know, though, as, we'll, as I'll mention in a little bit, it, it actually is earlier in terms of when it first gets celebrated, okay? But what we really have is the first part of it is Vespers, right? Anyone who's familiar with Vespers knows the way pre-sanctified starts, right, is Psalm 103, the Litany of Peace. Then we have the monastic reading of the Psalms. During this time, it's Psalm um, Cathisma 18. We've talked... Some of us have talked about what a cathisma is, right? These sections of the Psalms. Psalm, uh, cathisma 18, which is the Hebrew hymns of ascent. That's what, was, uh, what we say at Vespers every weeknight during Lent. Okay? And so that, even if you were to say Vespers on Tuesday night or Thursday night during Lent without a pre-sanctified liturgy, you'd say those same Psalms that we read tonight. Then we have Kiria Kekraksa, right? Lord, I have cried with the sensing of the church and the various hymns of the day that are sung, followed by Fosi Laron, Gladsome Light, right? Notice Gladsome Light is just recited during these days. During a, a non-festal weekday like this, you just sort of intone it or read it very subdued. You'll also notice in general the pre-sanctified liturgy has a much more subdued character to it, right? You'll notice that when I do the petitions out there, I'm actually higher than I'd like to be. If you watch the way it's done in Greece or in uh, Constantinople and some of the other places, right, it's um, again and again in peace, let us pray to the Lord, help us, save us, have mercy on us, and protect us, O oh God, by your grace. It's very monotone, very low, very quiet, very subdued, right? Until you get to the litany right after communion, when you can be a little bit brighter. We're happy now. We just took communion, right? Um, so, we get to Fossilaron, and then the readings start, right? 
And this is exactly what Codex Barberini lays out. After the Vespers portion, readings, let my prayer arise, Lord have mercy, prayers for the catechumens and faithful, prayers for the transfer of the gift, the Our Father, communion, prayer after communion, prayer at the end. It's the same order that we still follow today. Right? So let's dissect a few of these pieces. First of all, does this make sense? Um, having just walked out of it for the most part, right? Does that more or less make sense, kind of the structure we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, is the more subdued character um, just to, I mean, I, is it because we're, we're fasting and then it's mm -hmm. less celebratory? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, weekday Vespers generally, outside of Lent, when it's not a feast day, is already going to be a little bit more subdued. Fosse Laron is red, there's no entrance. Deacons don't serve. Deacons are considered sort of a festal ornament to the service. So Orthros and Vespers, for example, on a normal weekday, no deacons serve, okay? Only if it's a feast. Um, you know, or if you're about to have liturgy. Um, yeah, it's just, it's that. It's Lent, it's repentance time. We keep everything very subdued. Right. Less that's and then in, in, Holy, in Holy Week, when it gets even just a little bit more subdued and more solemn, it can be a real, really jarring for people who haven't been to the weekday Lenten services mm -hmm. and are only used to Sunday services and they show up at Holy Week and it's like really, really, really different, right? Now, in some respects, it's nice. It means that they, they like it probably. I mean, it's, it's a unique experience. But if you've been going to weekday services during the Lent, first of all, if you go to weekday services during the year, where the hymns of repentance are sung even on a regular weekday, Lenten weekdays then are definitely a step down in terms of a little bit more subdued and solemn, but not so crazy by comparison. And then if you're used to a regular Lenten weekday, then, um, you know, Holy Week is still, again, another step, but it's not so jarring, right? Um, I, I have a question. I thought I heard our Father three times, not two times. Well, yeah, it's being said during the Trisagium prayers of the ninth hour okay. and the dismissal, right? Okay. But there's one where it's much more solemnly said. We say the creed, mm -hmm. then there's a prayer, pardon, forgive, remit, O Lord, our transgressions, mm -hmm. And then the Our Father, kind of on its own, not as part of the Trisagion prayers, mm -hmm. and that's and that's part of the pre-sanctified. Pre that's part of the typica, the typica service oh, okay. that we're oh, talking about, right? Service, With the ninth yes. hour, yeah. When we get to pre-sanctified liturgy, the Our Father is only said one time. After the great entrance, right? There's the pluerotica, the the okay. petitions, and then the Our Father. Yeah. This is the Our Father that is the preparation for. General structure makes sense. We're going to dive into a few of these a little bit more specifically. Okay, so um, why are we reading from Genesis and Proverbs during Lent? Right, and it's not just on the days when we are pre-sanctified. Right, it's every weekday during Lent. Right, we're reading Genesis and Proverbs at Vespers. Right? Well, the reason is because the theological instruction of the catechumens focused on Genesis. Who is man? Who is God? What is sin? What state have we fallen to? Right? Remember the, step back for a minute and remember, Lent is a participation in the catechumenate all over again. Right? Where Lent begins, and this is a much bigger discussion that we can't go into in too much depth right now, but Lent's origins, the 40-day fast origins, are in the preparation of catechumens for their baptism at Pascha. They would spend 40 days fasting and being instructed by the bishop and in preparing intensely for their baptism. Over time, the church began to see this would be really good for all of us to do. And not just do once, but to do it 
over and over again. And eventually it's become so common and so universal, which is a good thing, We've forgotten, though, that it's tied originally to the preparation for baptism. Because what's baptism? Death and resurrection in Christ, right? And so in reality, what's happening is when we participate in the saving days of Holy Week, we're reliving our baptism. It's not a historical drama like a play to remember what happened with Christ some time back ago. What we're doing is reminding ourselves and reliving in ourselves what we have experienced in baptism and continue to live in Christ every day, dying and rising in Him. And so Lent is once again a participation, so to speak, in catechumenate. And this was the time after the ninth hour that the bishop would sit down with the catechumens and teach them. And he was not teaching them doctrines like the Incarnation, or about the sacraments, or about, frankly, most of the stuff that we now spend the majority of our time in catechumenate talking about. You got that after your baptism. Okay. You know when they taught you the Our Father? <laughs> Does anyone know when they taught you the Our Father? If you were in, Latin, in Rome, in the Latin tradition, they taught you on Palm Sunday. Okay. If you were in the East, in Constantinople and Jerusalem, uh, they taught you on Good Friday, and you had one day to memorize it, to be able to say it at your baptism the next day. Which led to some people occasionally joking that, you know, people in the East must have been a little bit smarter and a little bit more illiterate than those <laughs> folks out West. Um, I resemble that. Um, anyway, but the main instruction that the bishop is giving people is these basic concepts out of the book of Genesis. Who are we? What is creation? Who is God? What is sin? How did we get this way? Right? And what were the promises that God gave from the very beginning that he would eventually save us? And then the second focus of the teaching of catechumens was teaching them how to live a Christian life. Um, I'm going to make a global criticism that is grossly unfair, and there are more exceptions probably than there are examples of this. Too often our catechumenate in the Orthodox Church in this country focuses on teaching complex theological concepts as if it's a seminary class, and not enough on this basic point, which is how do you live a Christian life? What does it look like to be an Orthodox Christian? And quite frankly, I think we'd be better off preaching a lot more of that to our people in the pews as well. Because you find a lot of people that can tell you what a third ecumenical council is, or maybe not, but they don't know the very basics of how to actually live the faith. Where was the third ecumenical council? <laughs> Um, anyway, sorry, I was, just, I was just seeing if there was anybody who could prove my point. But anyway, so if the primary focus then it was Genesis and then this practical living, one of the most practical books on how to live a Christian life in the Bible is the book of Proverbs, right? And so these are the two books that we read during Lent as sort of a renewal and a refreshing of our catechumen. Make sense? Um, read the readings each day from the services, even if you're not at church. Read them. You can find them on 50 different websites and in a whole host of other books. <coughs> read, read them. Um, but as you read them now, you'll understand why we're reading them now in particular. Right? Some people will say, well, it's because we're reading the Old Testament during Lent. Well, we read the Old Testament other times too, right? When do we read the Old Testament at Vespers? Every feast day, right? So that's not just a Lenten thing. It's, it's very, very specific. And what do we change to in Holy Week? Does anyone know? Exodus and Job, right? I'm not going to give you the answer. Read them and tell me why we read those at Holy Week. 
What is one of the most famous lines from Job? I know that my Redeemer lives. Okay. Um, in between the readings, the priest comes out and says what? The light of Christ illumines all. He holds up the candle. This is very ancient in the censer. Okay. This actually comes, and we can find examples of this even still in the, the Talmud and elsewhere. It comes from the ancient Jewish practice of giving thanks in the evening for the gift of light in the darkness. It's the same theme that we see in Fosi Laron, the gladsome light, right? Same theme in Vespers. But this comes out of ancient Jewish practice. In earlier times, the deacon would actually bring in the light at every Vespers and, and make the proclamation to the people and then bring it back into the, into the altar. Okay? Um, and, and would often bring it out and sense the people as he did it. But by about the 12th and 13th centuries, we see that this is becoming more commonly the role of the priest. The liturgical texts from that time are starting to say the priest does this, and there's sort of a split that eventually shifts towards the priest doing it. Okay. Um, this, this comes out of the Syriac tradition, which was very Semitic, which is why it's sort of coming out of Jewish practice, right? Um, and it continues in the pre-sanctified liturgy, even though it falls out of usage in our other Vespers services. Okay. Um, and then, after Proverbs, we have, let my prayer arise, right? Very solemnly, as the priest senses the altar, and then the people, the deacon stands opposite him with the candle, and he's sensing. This is an example of a great prokimenon. Remember, we've talked about before, a prokimenon is a verse from the Psalms that's sung, usually right before or right after a reading from Scripture. Okay? Um, and a great prokimenon is one that's a little bit longer and repeated a couple extra times. Another example of a great prokimenon is um, what we sing at Vespers on Pascha and uh, Pentecost, for example, who is so great a God as our God? 2,000 megas, right? Um, that's another example of a great prokimenon. Another example of a great prokimenon is what we sing at Forgiveness Vespers. As the priest is changing, the, the clergy are changing all of the, the cloths and everything from white or gold to purple and black, He's changing his vestments, and we sing, Turn not your face away from your child, for I am afflicted. Um, give heed to me speedily, um, and uh, visit us. I forget the exact ending of that procumenon. But it's a longer one. It stretches out, and we repeat it more times. This is the same thing, right? And it's specifically coming out of, again, that Syriac tradition, um, where it's being sung responsorially during Vespers, right? Constantinople also sings this hymn during Vespers, every Vespers still to this day. How did they sing it? Kyrie prose. Right, you have the verse followed by, Hear me, O Lord. And then another verse, Hear me, O Lord. We still keep this in our Vespers, even outside of Lent. Right? So you see here, this we're using that phrase, let my prayer rise as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. There's two ways. There's the Byzantine or Constantinopolitan way, and there's the Syriac way. In pre-sanctified liturgy, we're seeing both of them, whereas in normal Vespers, we're only using the Constantinopolitan form. Does that make some sense? It's a little bit in the weeds. It's a little technical. But it's kind of cool to see that this is both the Greek and the Semitic traditions coming together in one, one service, using the same verse, you know, for the same purpose, but doing it in a different way. Right? In both cases, we're offering incense in the evening, singing the psalm verse. Right? Make some sense? Okay. So when you see it, you can kind of remember it like next pre-sanctified. When I go through sensing the whole church at Lord I have cried, Kiria Kekraksa, that's the Byzantine way. And then when we're doing it, um, you know, Father and I are going around the altar opposite each other, we're doing it the Semitic way. Right. Um, all right. 
then we transfer the gifts, right, from the parentheses around to the altar through the great entrance, right? It's very solemnly done. The priest, notice the chanting stops before he begins the great entrance. And the entrance is done in silence. The priest is only repeating through the prayers of our Holy Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy sins to save us. Amen. Repeating that, right? Um, in fact, that prayer is said throughout. So when Father and I vest, we've talked before in the liturgy about keros, right? For the prayers of preparation that the clergy say before they vest and before they begin the service. There's a whole series of prayers, and we say the prayers for each of the icons as we venerate them and all this stuff, right? Pre-sanctified liturgy, none of that. We just say the prayers of our Holy Fathers over and over again. Okay? As we vest, normally we've talked about the fact that there are prayers for vesting, right? Prayers for each vestment from the Psalms or elsewhere in Scripture as we put the vestments on. Pre-sanctified liturgy, we have all the, uh, or you don't put that on anymore. Right, the prayers of our Holy Fathers over and over again. It's very subdued, it's very simple. Basically, we're just saying the Jesus prayer over and over again. Right? Um, and so this continues even in the great entrance. Okay. The prayer, the, the hymn that the, the choir is singing, even there, right? Um, now the powers of heaven do serve with us, for behold, the mystical sacrifice already accomplished draws near. In other words, the mystical sacrifice has already taken place. This is already consecrated, but it's being brought out. Okay, yeah. So, <clears throat> did people, I mean, adding and subtracting, right, to certain things, because a lot of this was Old Testament, uh, what, Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. Leviticus, so right. all these things that were being taught at that time mm -hmm. are being used here, and are they adding to it or subtracting from it or we're we're using it in the light of Christ Ooh. right it's more that I would say it's transformed right okay. yeah we're we're using these prayers these hymns these rituals from the Jewish tradition but Ooh. now transformed in the light of Christ um, because we now understand who the light is so because uh, it's saying 400s and 500 so like obviously the councils were getting together and mm -hmm. discussing, and so decisions were made to... Right. They're starting to formalize, for example, that we don't do liturgy on weekdays in Lent. That's starting to get formalized in this period. Um, the services of Vespers, for example, are starting to coalesce. They've, they've already coalesced pretty well by this point in their forms. Um, but they're figuring out how to apply them, right? We're, we've emerged from the catacombs and are starting to be able to worship more fully and more publicly. So, yeah, exactly. Um, right, right. So it would seem that already, as I put here, by the late 400s, early 500s, we have the order of the pre-sanctified liturgy pretty much worked out as it exists today, okay? Um, by the ninth century, they were actually using it on Wednesdays and Fridays outside of Lent if it wasn't a feast day. Okay. The days that we fast, they would do pre-sanctified liturgy, even outside of Lent. By the 12th or 13th century, they've, they've kind of settled on, no, we're not going to do that outside of Lent, only during Lent. But, you know, they, there was a sense of trying to remain consistent. If this is what we do on fasting days, then we should do it on other fasting days as well. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry, you just said that um, <clears throat> now, outside of Lent, if there's a, so there could be a liturgy, not a, a there could be not pre-sanctified, but regular liturgy right. now during the week. Now, now, so, right, with the exception of the week <coughs> before, with the exception of the week before Lent, which is unique, um, every other part of the year, on Wednesdays and Fridays, we serve normal liturgy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Even though we fast those days. Yeah. It's not fully Lenten. We we can we can have a liturgy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I repeat, one of these days, I'm going to convince Father to get black vestments. Anyway. Um, yeah. Why 
mean, by effort, I've never seen that. It's subdued. Or subdued, yeah. It's pretty common in Greece and, okay. and elsewhere. So it has nothing to do with that funeral we all were? Actually, the funeral we always were white and gold. That's a resurrection. Black is for Lent. And never during a divine liturgy. Right? So even in those traditions, for example, where you don't wear white and gold on Saturdays and Sundays during Lent, you see this in the Slavic and even sometimes in the Antiochian tradition, they won't wear white or gold on uh, Saturdays and Sundays during Lent. But then that's where purple comes in, right? Or a velvet, I mean, a, uh, like a burgundy, something like that, a deeper red, some kind of a darker color, but black is not appropriate for a divine liturgy as such, right? Yeah. Um, is that the same reason why the nuns also wear black and gold? So they can sort of like same reason I wear black. This is my funeral garment. We've died to the world. And um, every time that I put this on, I'm supposed to be remembering the fact that I'm dead to the world. This is my funeral garment. And it's the same with monastics. And in fact, the great schema, which is the garment that those monks and nuns who are the most advanced receive, is literally a burial shroud, and they and and they wear a burial shroud around. In the monastic tradition, at least in the Athenite tradition, do you know how they bury monks and nuns? They sew their vestment together with their arms crossed, and sew the exorason, the broader, you know, the big, the big uh, sleeved black vestment, outer vestment that we wear. <coughs> they sew it together, and they take the veil that they wear over their heads and they sew it together over their face, and they put them in the ground. No casket. No caskets. This is my burial garment. Oh. Talk about sobering. It's one of the reasons why, you know, there's a saying, uh, I know, Elder Frum used to say it, but it goes back older, much older than that. They, will, they would say to clergy, for example, your cassock will save me. Not because by wearing it somehow it's magic and I'm now going to heaven. The point is it's the reminder that we need of who we are and what we're called to at all times. So like you give up your life and you'll gain it? Yeah. I mean the, the, the way the Athenites put it, and I love this, this is in the, the dining room of the great Lavra on Mount Athos. If you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. <laughs> right? And it's actually, um, it's something that we should think about a lot more often. If you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. Um, Father Daniel Sisuev, the Russian martyr of recent times, truly a martyr. Um, wrote a little book, um, a guidebook, a guide for the immortal, or what to do if you die anyway. <laughs> and I love it. I just, I mean, even the title alone sort of tells you everything that you need to know, right? A guide for the immortal, or what to do if you die anyway. That's us. Um, all right. So. Um, how does this, how is this accomplished? Well, on the Sunday before, okay, when the priest is preparing the gifts, what he will do is prepare a second lamp on no or host, okay? Cut out a second piece, and it's prepared that prior Sunday. All of the prayers are said for it the same way as it is during a divine liturgy, right? And then... <clears throat> and at the um, holy things are for, are for the holy, right? So he's, he lives both of them. What you'll notice is tonight, there's that same part, right, where the, the deacon says, Proskumen, let us be attentive. And the priest says, the holy pre-sanctified gifts are for the holy people of God. If you pay attention, he's not lifting the amnon. He's not lifting the lamp. He only touches it. 
because it's already been lifted the prior Sunday. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Right? It's only ever <laughs> lifted one time. Um, the second lamb is then dipped in the blood of Christ. Either he'll dip it into the chalice or he'll take the spoon and pour it into the lamb and let it soak up. Um, and then it's placed into a special arcoforion, which is just a really nice Greek way of saying bread box. I mean, that's quite literally what it means, right? Bread, bread holder. Um, but, you know, you'll see, like, we have a nice gold box, basically, that it's placed into. Um, and then we will process it over to the prothesis, to the table of, of preparation, and it's, it remains there. Usually it's propped open a little bit so that it dries out and nothing um, you know, happens. Um, then, I said cathisma, but I should say cathisma, right? Remember those psalm, the psalm, cathisma 18, the psalms of ascent that I was talking about. Right after the great litany at the beginning of the, or, the Vespers portion of pre-sanctified liturgy, and the curtain closes. Yeah. What's happening is that Father is preparing the gifts then onto the discos. So he takes it out of the artiforion and he places it onto the discos, onto the pad, um, senses it, pours wine into the chalice, and then covers them with the veils for preparation to be then moved to the altar during the great entrance. Okay. Um, all that makes sense? Any, any questions on this? The point is that it's both the body and the blood, right? It's both the consecrated bread and the consecrated wine together, even if it's drying out a little bit. Are the two lambs cut out of two different loaves of bread, or is it one loaf? Cut the different loaves? <coughs> yes. Okay. There are plenty of priests who have kind of forgotten that and will cut it out of the same loaf. Because you notice on a stamp, right? On a prosphoro stamp, there's usually a big lamb, and then there's two little lambs on the top side and the bottom side. Properly speaking, that's the ipsuma, and the other one should be for, anyway, it doesn't matter. Properly speaking, they should come out of two, two close ones. Um, it doesn't always work that way. It's, it, it's not such a serious theological point. But got the typical one? Jared, you had a, a look like you had a question. Am I missing it? No. Okay. Good. Yeah, okay. Um, this is also why, notice Father and I drink from the chalice. Why? Because what he's doing is, at the appropriate time, he takes a piece of that lamb that has been soaked in the blood of Christ, places it into the chalice, and it diffuses. Right? Same way you can take... Um, Holy water, right? And if the bottle starts getting low, you fill it back up. The holy water fills the entirety of the bottle. It's sort of that same principle of play. Okay. That's, I will say, that's a somewhat disputed point. There are places within the Orthodox world and times where the priest would not drink from the chalice of the pre-sanctified liturgy. Okay. There's been some disputes over that, but generally the practice is we do. And it's, this, it's for this reason. Um, all right. In the dismissal, you hear Father commemorating St. Gregory the Dialogist, right? As the, the, whose divine liturgy we have celebrated. Well, it's kind of a funny thing. So, this is Pope St. Gregory the Great, who died in the year 604, okay? Um, who is known as St. Gregory the Dialogist because one of his most famous works is the Dialogues, okay? where he's basically having conversations with these holy people and recording what he, what he discussed with them. Um, <clears throat> the first time that we see this liturgy attributed to him in any written source isn't until the 15th or 16th century. It's very, very late. Okay. Um, and there's a whole history of how that sort of comes about. What we do know, though, is that from 579 to 586, St. Gregory was a deacon and the ambassador of Pope Pelagius II to the imperial court in Constantinople. 
it's a piece of his life that, that often gets overlooked. Because there's so many, he's an incredible saint. There's so many things that, that he did and that he was responsible for and to focus on his life. But one of the things that gets overlooked is that he actually spends these seven years in Constantinople as the papal representative there to the imperial court. Um, this is the time, if you remember what I was saying, pre-sanctified liturgy is getting pretty codified and solidified right around that time in the, in the fifth and sixth centuries, right? Um, <clears throat> so it's certainly possible that he indeed did, and this is pretty typical for what St. Gregory the Great was doing, the kinds of things he did in his life, he may have been the one to actually write down the liturgy he was observing, right? And that might be what the historical consciousness of the church has kind of retained in attributing this liturgy to him. He didn't create it. He didn't write it. We know that because we can see examples of it existing more or less before him. But maybe what's going on is that he was the first one to really kind of write it down and codify what he was seeing in the churches of Constantinople. And that's why we attribute the liturgy to him. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Do we see that in his writings? Not in any of the writings that are preserved, like in Latin or anything. Yeah. No, like I said, yeah, we, we don't really see it in writing until the 15th or 16th century. There are some references earlier than that, and it's kind of like, where is this kind of maybe coming from? And pro maybe this is, this is just sort of a speculative guess as to what might be going on here, um, and, and why the church is attributing this thing to him, despite the fact that we know this was not written by a Latin deacon visiting in Constantinople in the sixth century. Because there's too much other evidence of it existing before that. Yeah. I'm going to be the kindergarten student. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Pre schism pope. Absolutely. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that doesn't come around until at least the 11th century. Yeah. So. So there there was no dispute. <clears throat> we we love him. We have him in our calendar. We attribute the liturgy to him and commemorate so him there. The 15th, 16th, 16th century, it had already happened, right? Right. The schism has already happened at this point. But Which is kind of an interesting right thing, word. right? Yeah, the schism has already happened. And several centuries later, we're attributing this liturgy to a pope. Maybe not actually all the useful in polemics, right? Yeah. <laughs> Throws me off. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. He's worth reading, by the way. Yeah. So from what you said about you know, the connection with uh, Constantinople and so the, this Eastern... Syriac influence yeah. on it. Is, is there much of a connection with the Roman Rite or the Latin Church generally? Not really in this. Yeah. Because the Latin tradition, which we think probably was actually ordered by St. Gregory the Great, interestingly, yeah. Yeah. is that they do celebrate liturgy during the weekdays of Lent. <clears throat> right? They do have a pre sanctified liturgy, which they celebrate only on one day, which is Holy Friday. And we used to celebrate, at certain times, we did celebrate the pre-sanctified liturgy on Holy Friday as well. But eventually it became clear that that was not consistent with the overall mood of the day. We, we don't even do that, right? Even that is too celebratory. Um, so, no, there doesn't seem to be, I mean, if anything, you know, this factors into some of the disputes between the East and the West is that we accept the Quinisex or Pendecti Council as being ecumenical. The West did at one time, and then it became inconvenient and they stopped accepting it. And um, we said, hey, wait a minute. This council, this ecumenical council says, no liturgy on weekdays in Lent. And Rome says that's a local council, it doesn't apply to us. Even though there's lots of evidence that it was accepted by the papal legates and by the pope, uh, sort of the, the papal equivalent of stamped as received and, and, and ratified in Vatican. They hid it in the Vatican Library as an excuse for being able to say, this is centuries later, they said, we never got it, so we never ratified it, and so it's not ecumenical, and we never, it never applied to us until 
much later, all of a sudden, scholars going through the Vatican Library found it and went, actually, you did. Um, but for centuries, Rome would say, it doesn't apply to us because we never got it. Right. Um, anyway, we don't need to hash all that out right now. But. I don't know why. At one point, I had heard, I think, about the two saints by the liturgy being attributed to, mm -hmm. to St. Gregory and his influence uh, on the early church. Right. And I think I either conflated those two or was presented in a way like that was somehow related in a way other than just they both, you know, yeah. are more or less attributed. In, in the case of the pre-sanctified liturgy, there's no reason to think that he was yeah, participating in the development of the liturgy. It's more him as a liturgical observer and scholar writing down what he sees. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. We're just about done for tonight. But um, So why then are we receiving communion in this way? Why does the church encourage us? And I think St. Procomios of Chios really says it well. He quotes St. Basil the Great, I commune my parishioners four times a week, just like Chrysostom and the entire Church of Christ did. They had this habit to commune four times a week, and because during Great Lent the liturgy could not take place during the week, the Holy Fathers decided to issue a pre-sanctified for the sole purpose of communing Christians during the course of the you say pre-sanctified is only for clergymen? How many people have heard, right, only the clergy receive a pre-sanctified liturgy? Right? I mean, not anymore in this country, but there are plenty of parts of the world where you wouldn't go up for communion even during a pre-sanctified liturgy. He says, Behold, O reader, that as long as this practice of frequent communion was done by Christians, their hearts were inflamed by the grace of Holy Communion, and they would run to their martyrdom like sheep. Therefore, whichever priest prevents Christians from receiving the Immaculate Communion, let them know well that they are greatly sinning. However, I am not saying that we should commune simply at will, but with proper preparation. We should prepare and receive it as often as we can. Um, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, I used to love reading Rainbow. Anyway. Um, any other any other questions? I know I, I'm like I'm in the gap generation. I think nobody watched Reading Rainbow with Lamar Burton. Oh, okay, thank you. Know. Yeah, okay. Reading Rainbow, right? But you don't have to take my word for it. Oh. Kick it to the kids. <laughs> anyway, okay, sorry. It's too late for it's too late for subtle nerdy pop culture references. Anyway. Um, any other questions about pre-sanctified liturgies? Does this help sort of understand what we're seeing and kind of where it's coming from and, and why? Um, all right. To give people communion? Hmm? To, give communion. to give us communion, yeah. But, right. This might have been covered in the part I missed, but um, why is it typically done in the evening? So, yeah, because according to prop, if you really are keeping the fast to the strictest monastic precedent, you don't ever put anything in your mouth until after the third hour. You aren't eating or drink. I'm sorry, the ninth hour. You aren't eating or drinking anything until after 3 p.m. And so at the th after the third hour service, they would then do the prayers of preparation for communion, the service of the Tipikat, and then receive from the pre-sanctified gifts, and then they'd go have dinner. Right. Um, and that would be their one meal for the day around like five o'clock um, and so that that's the practice that has been maintained right and I mean because we're working we're in school or whatever else we relax the rules on this properly speaking the rules are still that you're supposed to fast from midnight until pre-sanctified liturgy communion now a lot of us aren't really capable of doing that anymore um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that in Greece, during Clean Week, during the first week of Lent, you'd find all these farmers, laborers, villagers, people working out in the fields in the hot sun, keeping the three-day fast at the beginning of Lent. They didn't eat or drink anything from Forgiveness Vespers until the pre-sanctified liturgy Wednesday. Right? 
for a variety of reasons, we've all gotten very weak. We just are. And God understands that, and, and the church blesses us to not have to keep things so strictly, right? But um, in those days, it was the same thing. They wouldn't eat or drink anything until after the pre-sanctified liturgy. In this country, generally speaking, the advice that you'll hear from spiritual fathers is that you can eat and drink, you know, general basic fasting foods up until about lunchtime, and then we fast from then on. Um, but even then, it should be lighter than normal. It shouldn't, you don't go and have a super burrito and a bunch of other stuff at lunch, right? And fill up totally, <laughs> and, uh, you know, stroll into pre-sanctified a few hours later, still burping. We, we eat light, and then you can eat afterwards. Um, I'm not telling you all to go out and do the three-day fast, right? But, but I mean, that is... So look, I say this to humble all of us, okay? So we get to the end of the fast, we're like, hey, you know, I haven't had anything dairy or meat in 49 days. I've kept the fast. I've been good, right? I didn't even have any alcohol during the weekdays, I'm, I've been great, okay? But you had your tofu and you had your fake stuff and you had three square meals a day and maybe you even snacked and whatever else, right? Okay. Really want to be strict about it. I've got the tipicon, according to the tipicon, right? From forgiveness vespers until after Wednesday pre-sanctified liturgy, you eat and drink nothing. You have one meal after pre-sanctified liturgy, and then you wait again and don't have anything to eat or drink until after the pre-sanctified liturgy Friday. You have one meal on Friday. Saturdays and Sundays, you're allowed two meals. Okay. Monday through Friday for the rest of Lent, one meal after 3 p.m. Pre-sanctified liturgy days, you fast until after communion from midnight. Holy Week rolls around, um, you know, light meal Monday, light meal Tuesday, light meal Wednesday after the pre-sanctified liturgies on those days, nothing else. Holy Thursday, you have a slightly more substantial meal after the celebration of the Lord's Supper, um, the institution of the Mystical Supper, and then you don't eat again. Um, really until Pascha. After the Divine Liturgy, Saturday morning, the Vesperal Basil Liturgy, you have some fruits, some nuts, artoclasia, fasting artoclasia, uh, maybe some, uh, uh, some water, and maybe one small glass of wine, no oil. And that's all you have, and then you break your fast after Pascha. Okay. And none of us are keeping that. I, I want to be really clear, I'm not telling you to keep that. I don't keep that, okay? I'm pretty sure if you asked your spiritual father if you could do that, he would say no, okay? My point in saying that all is just, when you get tempted to start patting yourself on the back at the end of the fast, or halfway through, right? A little Jack Hornering in all. We've got nothing to pat ourselves on the back about. Yeah, for an hour. Right, right, right. We don't know what fasting is, really. Right. Um, anyway, Grow, growing up, we <clears throat> Saturday was like no food. Yeah, and we didn't eat anything until, and you know, being kids, it was just yeah. like large. <laughs> yeah, your stomach's growling. Yeah, you're going crazy. And, you're drinking. Yeah. and then as soon as I mean, the soup is so. Oh, I know. You smell the margarita, and they're getting the ramp, lamp ready to throw it on the spit. And, you're dying. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no. That's just one day, you I know. With that. The rest, like right. you said, the meals, right. through the rest of the week. Oh, I'll tell you, for the heart of, you know, I always help Smarto with making the margaritas on Saturday after liturgy. And the moment that the onions, the garlic, and the lamb start hitting to brown, um, I realize how not ascetic I am. <laughs> The oh, come out, you know? oh man, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and then like I'm ready. Oh, it's there comes a point where I'm like, you know, I gotta excuse myself. I gotta leave. This is not good for me. Um, 
Anyway, any other questions on precinct spot? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that on Holy Friday there's um, no limitations for the precinct spot um, Are there any other? Oh, we'll keep you busy. Uh, well, no, I mean, are there any other days of the year where that happens? Basically? Yeah, actually, I mean, interestingly, the Wednesday and Friday before Lent, Cheese Fair Wednesday, Cheese Fair Friday, there are special preparatory services. They take on a Lenten uh, pattern in Orthros and Vespers with Old Testament readings from Joel and um, I'm blanking on the other day. Uh, but, you know, but there, are, there isn't liturgy appointed for those days. The exception, I think, sometimes is if, like, the Feast of the Forty Martyrs of Sebast, or the finding of the head of St. John the Baptist, February 24th, I think if either of those fall in those days, then you can have liturgy. But otherwise, um, we, we don't serve liturgy those days. So the three days of Lent are not liturgy. <clears throat> right. The, um, the only exception to all of that is on the old calendar. You can still potentially have Annunciation fall. On Good Friday. If Annunciation falls on Good Friday, there's a way that you do it. You have liturgy after Vespers. It becomes a, you do the normal Vespers of the unnailing, and then you have a divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom for the Annunciation, and then go right back into Holy Week, basically. Um, Annunciation is the exception, because that, that's What's that? Falling on Good Friday, yeah, it's very. It can't happen under the under the new un, under the new calendar, um, but under the old calendar it can, and occasionally it will fall on Pascha, which they call Kyrio Pascha, and then what you do is you just do all the hymns of Annunciation and all the hymns of Pascha, and it's a big old celebration. It's really, I mean, so I've read. It's really cool. <laughs> Any other questions? Or? All right. For the prayers of the Holy Fathers, which is Christ our God, have mercy and us to save us. Amen.